You guys have any questions about sandwich lease options from yesterday? I do. Can, okay, let's talk about it. Coach Nick, <laughs> what you got? So if it had the repairs, let's say we got fifteen to twenty thousand or twenty five thousand dollars worth of repairs, but it's a good, um, you know, they're open to lease, but the, you could do a good sandwich on that technically, but it's got about fifteen thousand to twenty thousand worth of repairs. Yeah, so w where do you fit it in on the board over here? Well, I, I mean, guess, and how does yeah. it work into the equation? Yeah, yeah. How does it work into the equation is where I'm where I'm trying to figure. Okay, all right. So let's assume the property value and all that, and the rate of appreciation. We know that we know fair market rent, and it has twenty thousand dollars in repairs. But this is a livable property, right? Right. Yeah, Very it's just livable. mainly just twenty thousand, like light repairs, like in updating and stuff like that. Okay. I'll just tell you from my experience on a, on a small end property, like we're talking hundred, hundred thousand, 150,000, somewhere in that neighborhood, you know, that it could be a deal killer, you know, $20,000 is a lot. All right. Um, normally what I do is, is I don't really consider repairs a part of the equation. Okay. Other than, I may take it into consideration when I cal calculate my tenant buyer price. And let's say my new tenant buyer price is going to be 113000 Well, if I know the tenant buyer is going to need to put down money and he's also going to make 20000 in repairs, is this deal going to work? No. Okay, probably not. Um, probably don't have rich enough blood there, you know, to be able to afford all of that and qualify for the loan in time with extra down payment probably even being required by their home loan lender. So that's probably not going to work. But if let's assume the repairs were reasonable, like 5K, okay, maybe that would work. Maybe the guy's handy and he can actually buy the supplies for 2,500 and he can do the labor for free. Okay, so maybe, okay, now we're talking, but I usually, I usually don't actually play it into the equation unless it's, unless I need to just reduce the tenant buyer's purchase price to help compensate for some of these repairs. Okay? Or that's if you get the seller to accept the acceptable price for the repairs, right? Yes, that's true. Very true. Um, another thing you could do, I don't like it. Okay. Uh, I know someone who likes it a lot. I don't like it is you could sell it at full value and give them repair credit. Wow. Give the tenant buyer a repair credit. Okay. For everything they fix in the property, it reduces the purchase price by X amount of dollars. Okay. That might be a way to incentivize your tenant buyer to go ahead and complete the repairs. Okay. Because you run the risk of doing on these lease sandwich lease options. Okay. You run the risk of these, home uh these tenant buyers moving in there and being in their own way they had great visions of doing the flooring but now they got a couch sitting on it and they can't okay you know what i'm saying right right and so it was just like well we'll do it after we buy it okay well but that's not going to work right so i don't recommend doing sandwiches on anything but beautiful pretty houses and if it's a or or just real minor repair, like just maybe the guy's gonna paint the cabinet Fresh paint. or something. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, um, paint the garage because it was never the drywall was never finished or something. You know, fix you know stuff like that. Okay, that's fine, but not major twenty thousand, thirty thousand in cosmetic. It's not gonna happen, man. And I don't want to be in the middle of that sandwich when it goes bad. Plus, you have to think, you know, will those repairs need to be done before they can qualify for the home loan? Yes, most likely. Because most likely. Some, sometimes they don't qualify if it's a major thing like air yeah. conditioning, roof, or whatever. 
Most likely, Mateo, you're absolutely right. And then, uh, and if they do qualify, they're going to have to have an, uh, the lender is going to require an appraiser to come out. Right. So even if the house would qualify for the loan, the appraiser is probably not going to appraise it that high because it still needs all this little cosmetic piddly stuff. Now you got another problem. You see where I'm coming from? So sandwich pretty houses assign away the ones that have hair on them. <laughs> That's what I think. That's what I think. Anybody else have any comments or questions on that? What do you think about that, Coach Nick? I mean, you're a smart guy. Are you seeing it from a different angle? No. I mean, if it's uh... – the only thing is, like, if it was – the only way I would see that working is if you did get it low enough on the cash offer. Like, if you're going to make a cash offer kind of thing and they take that, but you do it in terms of a sandwich and you just find somebody who wants to take that over and do the repairs, like a fixed flip, who wants to maybe lease it uh, for a couple of months and then cash it out quickly on the flip. But you would have to really know your buyers at that point if they – if they would even want to do something that quick, I would think. I think, honestly, uh, the best solution here is probably not a lease option at all. It would probably most likely be a subject to or some kind of seller carryback kind of situation where you can uh, play the bank, like Coach Steve talks about, play the bank instead of, uh, you know, the sandwich guy. And uh, that way you sell the house at, at the, the price that you want. You get the payment you want. And they own the house and the repairs. Yeah, that's that's a good yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. So you know, lease options aren't a, uh, a, a, a they're not the. They're, I guess they're the Cinderella slipper in a sense that they don't fit all the fat girls. They just you know <laughs> just the, just the, the perfect one. You know, <laughs> looking for that right foot. <laughs> well, that's the story, right? Some of the sisters they had their feet were too fat for that slipper. You know, yeah. so you know. <laughs> I'm not being a misogynist here or what whatever whatever they call that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with fat girls. That, that's right. <laughs> that's you damn right, Jerry. Not a thing in the world wrong with fat girls. Yes, they need love and we all need love. We all need love. <laughs> that's absolutely right. All right, let's get this back on track. Gary, I'm I'm gonna do like we did in school. I'm gonna write your name on the board. <laughs> did they ever do that when you were a kid? You acted up in school and they wrote your name on the board. Just add about four checks next to it, and that sounds about right. Yeah, you get a check mark or two or three or four or something like that, and you go to the principal's office or you get detention or something like that. I just I'm I just got to the point where I was like, hey, just go ahead and put my name up there right away. <laughs> uh, yeah. You just walk into the class, you start writing your name, then you go sit down. Yeah, yeah. Basically, <laughs> sure, I'll just write my name up there myself. Put a couple checks up there right away, because I'm convinced you don't like me. You know, it's awesome. I had that problem. <laughs> well, yes, we've all had school woes. Does that make sense about the repairs? Everybody, if you run across a house with repairs, okay. Okay, any other questions about sandwiches or lease options? Be picky about your sandwiches, okay? Be picky about your sandwiches and be picky about your your tenant buyers, okay? All right. Uh, somebody was uh, wanting to talk about the conversation level of sandwich lease options, too. I'm not sure who that was. I can't remember. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. You guys I've, I've, about... got, I've gotten a couple of where we were kind of going that way, and then sometimes it just goes like sideways, and I'm trying to get them back on track, but I just end up going and signing it anyway at that point. Okay. All right. So um, it's, it's in probably how you presented that you'll stay in the middle. Um, so – the assumption to me is, is that you will be in the middle until you tell them that you won't be. I don't know what happened in that conversation or conversations that they believe that it would be not including you. Does that make sense? They, uh, they had asked about um, 
So like they basically say, so, oh, you, you, you're, when I said, I want to put like some good people in there, like, oh, well, you want to um, just, you know, help me find and facilitate. Then I said, well, I can do that, but I'm really actually wanting to see if, um, you know, for me, if this is going to work out for me as an investment and I, you know, I'm going to want to put people in there as an investor, I got to make a return on my investment. And that's what I'm going to want to do. Um, is that going to be a problem? And they were like, well, I just, I, I actually just want to just assign or not, they didn't say, assign, I just want to sell it, you know, uh, to whoever wants to get it is wants to get it. That's it. So I just kind of left it at that and put it more of the assignment deal versus trying to go the sandwich route. Okay. All right. So yeah, I understand where you're coming from. There's a couple things I would have said there along that uh, conversation line. Um, that would have maybe steered it in a little different direction uh, when they were talking about, um, you know, they were saying you, you just want to put some people in there and all that. And, uh, and I would have said, yes, but you'll be working directly with me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, I, yes. And that's me. I want to be the guy that buys the house. Okay. And I want to put some good people in. I'm just telling you as an investor what I'll do with the property, but you'll be dealing directly with me. Is that a problem? Is that is that something that makes you uncomfortable? Okay, something like that. All right. So, and the the explanation is the same as the as the assignment lease option. Hey, you know, here's I'm an investor, like I told you, and here's what I want to do. I want to put some good people in there. I want to make a little money doing it. And you know, I know this also needs to be a good solution for you. So, is this something we can talk about putting together? Okay. All right. So. To me, a sandwich is actually easier, like probably nine times out of 10, if you're inclined to do a sandwich, mm -hmm. because they already assume that you're the person because they're talking to you. Okay. And a lot of times, here's what I hear is that from the homeowner is that it makes them feel good to know that I'm there because they like me. Right. So if they don't like you, then that's not going to happen. Right. But, and if they have crazy ideas, they have crazy ideas, but nevertheless, most, most folks, in my experience at least will, you know, feel more comfortable with me being in the middle because they know that that's going to be somebody that's going to be there to help manage that deal. Okay. You know, make sure that, you, you know, maintenance. Okay. I understand you don't have to do any Mr. Homeowner. Okay. So, if I have to get involved and tell the tenant buyer, hey, you need to fix the, the runny toilet, okay, then that's, you know, I'm here for that, okay? So th that makes them feel good. You know, does that make sense to everybody? So in a sense, doing a sandwich lease option is a lot easier than doing a, an assignment because in an assignment, I feel like we have to talk them through being comfortable with me getting out of here and you just being me, me dumping these people off on you. Right. So, Mr. Homeowner, if I put you in the driver's seat, and I'm going to say this no matter what, assignment or sandwich, either way, Mr. Homeowner, if I put you in the driver's seat and I allow you to look at this person that I'm going to put in there, you know, that I want to put in there, if I allow you to look at their background screen and their legal screen and their income and job verifications, and you get maybe you can get to meet them too when they go look at the property and you get to approve or disapprove them, does that make you feel more comfortable? Because I, I know you're being very flexible with me and I don't want to put someone in there you're not comfortable with. Is that something that makes you more comfortable? Or if I put that in the document, can we have a deal today? Okay. So those are the type of things that you'll hear me say because I want that person to be cooperative with me in the in the assignment or in the sandwich, either way. I want them to be cooperative with me and I want them to share some ownership in this transaction. Right. So if something does go bad, I still have some bridge left with mm -hmm. this person, you know, and things will go bad sometimes. So this is, I've learned this the hard way. You don't do this. You, you'll regret it later. If something goes bad, you'll regret it because you don't, you, you, that guy there, he doesn't, he doesn't really trust you much. He doesn't really know what's going on. He doesn't even like you too good you know, and you've not kept in contact with him at all. And it's been eight months. And now that tenant buyer stopped making a payment. You missed the payment. Okay. So what, what do you do? Uh-oh. 
Well, you either dig in your pocket or you call the homeowner and say, hey, we got we got trouble on the horizon. I'm just trying to give you a, a heads up. OK, here's what's going on. Right. So that's a whole other conversation. I could tell you what to say. But <laughs> but nevertheless, a sandwich lease option is like it's almost like you're partnering with that homeowner. Right. So you want to treat them as as someone who needs to be informed and kept up to date on things. Okay, that's that's been my experience. There's probably some coaches out there that would tell you the complete opposite of that. And I, I, I've met some students that have had other coaches that taught them to just go out there and sign these up, and they don't teach them any of what I just said at all. And then eight, nine, ten months later, when that tenant buyer stops making payments and the shit hits the fan, they've said stupid shit like this. Okay, to the homeowner. Uh, Mr. Homeowner, well, you know, to the question, the homeowner always has, well, what happens if they stop making payments? You know, well, Mr. Homeowner, don't worry about that. We'll we'll take care of that. If we have to evict them, we'll evict them and we'll get somebody else in there and you won't you won't have to worry about it at all. OK. All right. Only problem is, is when the coaches tell their students that the students don't have any money and they don't have any knowledge to go do an eviction in the eighth or ninth or 10th month or whenever it is that that tenant buyer stops making payments. So now they're in a real pickle. They didn't save any of the option fees, so they can't make any payments. They don't have any money for an eviction. Okay, now what do they got to do? They got to call the homeowner and just be like, hey, I'm a complete loser. My tenant buyer, he totally is not making the payment this month. And here's the bad news. I'm broke too. And here's more bad news. I can't afford to evict the guy, so I'm just going to assign this deal back over to you and walk away. Okay, that's why if anyone hates lease option investors, that's why. Because that's crazy. And unfortunately, I could name some big time coaches and gurus that teach their students to do that kind of shit. Now, they don't teach them to do that, but they set them up for that ultimate outcome. Okay. What I'm trying to do is teach you to set it up intelligently at the beginning so that your, your homeowner is more like a partner, okay? And he understands that, yeah, you're buying this house and I'm working directly with you. And if there's a problem, you and me decided to start this and we're going to see it through, okay? That kind of thing. You can build that kind of mentality with a homeowner, sure. And the conversation that you'll end up having if you do that, if the tenant buyer goes bad it, later on, is, hey, Mr. Homeowner, it's Justin. You know, I've called you every month or two for the last eight months, and everything's been going great. I hate to tell you, we got some bad news. The payment didn't come in, and I called them, and they said that they, they didn't have the money this month. And so we're going to need to make a change, Mr. Homeowner. Here's what I recommend us doing, okay? Or here's, here's what, you remember that guy that we put in there, Mr. Homeowner, you and me, we decided. Okay, because remember, I put him in the driver's seat. So he's going to decide, all right, with me. All right, anyway, I think I'm boring everybody to death. Everybody turn their cameras off and fall asleep. <laughs> no, right, no, 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 no. It's actually. No, you're doing a great job. Keep going. Thank you, sir. Thank it's you, sir. It's actually a good thing that you tell us that because, you know, we need to know what it can go wrong. And you probably have some, some of that happen to you. So I have had it happen more than a couple times. So that's, that's why you should tell us. Yep. Like, so we don't have, yep. we, we learn on your experience and so we don't have to go. Yep. We may have to go through that experience, but at least we're going to be ready for. Yeah. Let me tell you what I did in my early days. Okay transparency here um in my early days i was going out and signing up sandwich lease options because i didn't know how to sign up an assignment lease option i didn't know the course i bought for 99 dollars didn't teach me how to do an assignment lease option only a, a sandwich so i was out there swinging for the fences and signing up sandwich after sandwich after sandwich after sandwich this one didn't have much monthly income or any this one here had 200, this one had 250, okay? So it was just a mess. And uh, I quickly became an asset millionaire. You guys remember what that means? 
Okay. I was well on my way to becoming an equity millionaire. And all of a sudden the market crashed and what was it? 2008 or 2009 round about there. A bunch of my tenant buyers stopped making payments. So picture this, picture this, picture Mr. Justin sitting down at his desk and I'm just, I'd have to do this two or three times a month now and get my checkbook out, get my pen out, get my pad of paper out with all my mortgage information for all these deals. Cause remember I'm paying the mortgage company directly. Remember that's one of the rules. So I get, I get my pad out with all that info and I start writing checks and I'm like, there's 1200. Here's another one for 1350. Here's a second mortgage for, 125 here's another one for 1400 here's another one for 1600 here's another one for 750 here's another one for 850 calculate it all up 10 it's 000. painful it's painful yeah. just hearing that <clears throat> horribly painful dude ten thousand dollars i was paying out that i hadn't collected it was roughly wow. 10,000. Yeah, because I was stupidly throwing sandwiches together out of everything. Okay. So necessity came that way. But because necessity came that way, I got to thinking, how do I get out of these deals that aren't paying me? And I thought about it and I thought about it and I talked to people about it. Nobody had any ideas and I thought about it. Finally, it dawned on me. I could assign this deal back to the tenant buyer that's defaulting on the loan or on the, on the deal. I could assign it over to him, piss the seller off completely and walk away. I was like, well, that's going to piss off all these sellers. I mean, hardcore piss them off. Not only are they not getting any money, but now I'm out. Okay. And they're stuck with that guy in the house. So I set up, I picked up the phone and I started calling tenant buyers and I set up appointments with all of them. And I went over to their house and I took an assignment agreement and I filled it out. And I said, Hey, he, 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 here's what I'm going to do here. Here's, here's Mr. Justin back when he was a little bit more con man. Okay. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Tenant buyer, here's what we're going to do. You know, you've been doing good, and I know you're in a little trouble right now, but I believe in you, and I like you, and there's no reason for me to even be in the middle of this anymore. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you directly with the man that owns this property. His name's on the deed. Of course, you understood all that when we did this, right? So, but, you know, he's the man on the deed. So let me let me go ahead and just assign this over to you, give you his contact information, and then bid you the best of luck. Does that sound like something we could do today? Would that be better if I put you – one step closer to home ownership here by doing this. Yeah. I said, not only that, but look at all this equity. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stick around for. So you're going to get a better deal. You're going to save money. Okay. Every one of them said yes. <laughs> so I signed them up, man. <laughs> and it wasn't, but about 24 hours later, my phone started blowing up, man. And I mean, every seller was like ready to just fucking murder me. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I set a couple appointments with a couple of them. Why? I don't know. I had nothing. To <laughs> and I went out to their house, met them out at the property that they were doing the deal with me for, met them in the driveway. You, you and brought a gun with you or something? No, I guess I just brought my big brass balls. I don't know <laughs> because I had nothing to offer. All I had was is a dumb look on my face and an I'm sorry that it worked out this way. And here's what I think you could do, you know, maybe get rid of them and clean it up and put it back on the market. And please, please forget my name. Okay. Okay. See, they never, ever tell experiences like that and other coaching programs because it don't sell, okay? But when you get into the sandwich game, okay, if you're not intelligent about it, you will create a monster, all right? So 
I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to say, don't make an no, don't make a deal that would be perfect for an assignment. Don't turn it into a sandwich just because you've got a hankering for a sandwich. Okay, because it, it's just not a good deal. All right. So anyway, any questions? Yeah, you got sued. You got you. You're being sued for that. Like some some never, of the never oh. been sued. And you know, I was smart about it because I did all these deals in an LLC. Okay. And so when the L when the LLC and actually what happened is, is I had about seven other properties that I sold all in a group to a guy for like not much. And I just dumped everything in that LLC. Okay. So I okay. dumped everything in that LLC and I, and I was like, Hey, if you want to come for me, you're going to have to come for the LLC because that's what I signed everything in. And that LLC, the only thing it owns is that bullshit deal you're talking about. <laughs> so what are you going to get? Nothing. Okay. So they didn't, I never got sued. Okay. Does that make it right though? No. Okay. Maybe today to some people. Okay. Cause I heard this big, big coach guy supposed to be multi, multi million, billion, whatever shit. Okay, I heard him saying that that today it, it's not about what you can do that's right or wrong. And it's not even about what you can do. It, 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 is it ethical? It's not about what? that at all. He said this rich, rich coach guy, he said this. I heard him. I listened to it over and over just to make sure. He said today it's about what can you do and get away with. And he was teaching this as a mindset. And I'm like, see, that's that's going to bring heartache, misery, trouble, galore. You know, that's going to bring more regulation to the business. That's what it's yeah. going to bring. Yeah. I was like, what a nutty fucking thing to say. OK, everybody should hit the unsubscribe button on that dude. I won't say who it was, but yeah, nevertheless, okay. you don't have to just put it in the chat room. Just put it, just put it in there. <laughs> well, he does have a lot of other good things to say, so I'd hate to hang a man for one thing he did, but, you know, that's nevertheless, it was a horrible thing to say, all right? And that is not the mentality of a successful lease options artist, which is what I like to think of myself as. <laughs> I'm the artist. <laughs> I'm the lease option artist. Hold on, I even got the right stuff. Just in case I want to, <laughs> just in case I want to be an artist. Yeah. So if you're going to be a lease options person, be smart about the sandwiches. Any questions? Justin, have you ever been desperate and put somebody in a house that you knew wasn't going to qualify because you needed the money? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I am. I am guilty. You guys are taking me to church today. And making me confess, <laughs> I have, and it has never, it, it worked out just exactly as you would think it would, okay, and that that's some of the deals that, some of that happened in some of those, okay, some of those people, those tenant buyers, they didn't belong in those houses, maybe you got, might even argue that they, none of them did, so, you know, I've definitely made that mistake. That's why I tell you, you know, even on the assignments, be very, be very choosy. Make sure your tenant buyer can qualify because if you skip that step to get the cash, it will come back to haunt you later. Because that, even though you walked away and you're not legally responsible, your phone will still ring when that seller has a problem with that tenant buyer. Even though you're not legally reliable, you're not responsible, you assign the deal away, your phone is still going to ring. And I don't know about you guys, but once I have a really bad conversation like that, it kind of fucks my mind up the rest of the day. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you mess with someone else like house and is a, one of the biggest assets some money somebody can have in their life for us it's like just number but for them it's like important 
you mentioned er, you mentioned early on that you uh, if the homeowner came at you, he could only get what was in the LLC. Did you have each house in a separate LLC? I did not. And that's a lesson learned too. Okay. That was a lesson learned in that time and era also. See, now you'll listen to other coaches and investors that will say, uh, if you're a landlord or something, only put two or three houses per LLC or something like that. I, to me, that sounds insane. Because if something goes wrong on one of those and they sue the LLC, they could get all three properties. I, that, that sounds crazy to me. So, But I had all my properties in one LLC. Okay, so that's why I was saying when that went down, I had like seven that were still good performing and I sold all of those to dump them out of that LLC, get a little cash that I needed to try to, you know, because I just wrote a $10,000 check out of my own account for those mortgages, okay? And I hadn't been saving the money. I hadn't been saving back option fees, okay? I was just living the dream, you know? Look at me. Look at me now. I did these deals and I got all this cash. Okay, cool. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to spend it as quick as I can. <laughs> that was what it was like. All right. So I didn't save any money. I had all of them in one LLC. I put myself in a, in a pickle and it was all of me. It was all revolving around bad decisions. Okay. And bad coaching, bad coaching. So I, that was a lesson learned, Jerry. So should you put every house deal that you do in a separate LLC? From my perspective, idealistically, yes. Practically, probably not. Okay. If you're assigning deals, who cares? You're not even staying in the middle. But once you How start about staying putting on, on, on a trust, it will be... It will be different on trust, but just from one LLC where you are the trustee. Okay, that might be possible too. I I'm not uh, okay. I'm All not right. a pro at that. What I do know about trust, I learned from being a, a retirement planner about 15, 20 years ago, <laughs> for about five years, and that was a whole different kind of trust. So. When I hear people talk about land trusts and trust for real estate instead of LLCs and stuff, I, I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to those things. And I need to I need to come up in that. But I've never personally ever used one. I've okay. always used, I've just straight used the, the LLCs. And now I have an S-Corp, okay? S-Corp. Okay. S-Corp is just, you can label your LLC as an S-Corp. It'll help save you tax money. But yeah. none of these things, none of these things are really all important until you start making some pretty decent money. No. Okay. Like, like how much is the tax deductible limit? Anybody know? For, 300, for individual? Plus 300 for this S Corp. When you get like to the 300,000 a year mark, it's probably better having an S Corp. So what I'm saying is, is if you're just an individual sole proprietor, no LLC or nothing, What's the tax deductible? What's the tax? When, when do you start paying taxes? What's that tax limit? Anybody know for an individual? It's like 12000 okay. And then you're going to have business expenses that you deduct from that 12000 You know, like, for example, if you made $12,000 in a deal, you're going to deduct some expenses off of that. Probably some internet expenses, probably some business programs like PropStream, probably your coaching. Okay. If you're not deducting real estate wholesalers club on your yearly business expenses, I don't know why you should be yeah. okay? because you're investing in business education, right? So th there's another $600 you don't have to pay taxes on <laughs> or whatever it is. All right. So, you know, um, yeah, start out just being a sole proprietor. Once you start making 12, 15, $20,000. Okay. Now open up an LLC. Learn how to do it. You can do it yourself. Your accountant can do it. You can do it online with legal legal Zoom or something like that. Even all right, it's like 150 bucks if you do it yourself. Okay, and then you can open up LLCs as often as you want if you want. Okay, but you don't need to if you're mostly in the assignment game. Okay, 
Does that make sense, everybody? I know business structure is not something we talk about much either, but does anybody have questions on that? I'll try to help you if I can. I'm not a business structure expert either, but I can tell you what I know from my experience. So you're well, saying you're saying if you are signing contracts, you don't need an LLC. Well, I like to have an LLC no matter what I'm doing, but see when you do it in an LLC or even in your real name, you're putting it under contract, you're finding a tenant buyer, and then you're assigning it away. So you're removing that asset. The contract is an asset that the that the LLC, the company owns. Okay, if you signed it with the LLC, that's an asset. That contract is an asset the company owns. Now, if you assign it to a tenant buyer, you sell the asset. Now, the company owns cash, not the asset. Does that make sense? So, there you, you create some kind of a tax liability at some point when you start making cash. All right. So, in other words, you're not keeping any assets in the in the in the company you're selling the contract for the property so it's gone Co company doesn't own it anymore and now you have cash but jerry paid himself he went to the bank and he got all the money out of the business account so now the business is broke again so sue the business all you want it ain't got nothing to get you follow me yeah and that's the assignment game in and out in and out, in and out, like that, in the company, out the company. All right, so you could do that in your own name. You could do that in an LLC. Where it becomes really important to have LLCs is when you're in the sandwich game or in the landlord game or in a fix and flip game, okay? Something that's a little more heavy or more keeping you involved, okay? If you're going to stay involved, get protected with an LLC. If you're not going to stay involved, it doesn't much matter, really, does it? Because you're going to be gone. And there's no legal tie to you anymore once you assign a deal away. So does that make sense? I know it's a long, drawn-out explanation, but... Yeah, it so does have, make sense. So, so have you ever had a problem with your silent partner, Uncle Sam? Oh, definitely. And I do to this day. So you have a problem with Uncle Sam? Yep. 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 <laughs> every every day. Every day. And let me just tell you this. Keep out a piece of every deal you make. Oh yeah. For the tax man. Right? Okay. Now, the tax issues I have with Uncle Sam go all the way back to 2009. Okay? Can you think why? You already know why. Because I already said back when I was doing all that business, I was spending all the cash and I was living the dream. And when it all started coming to a problem, I had no resources for it. Okay. Any resources I had, I spent in the divorce. <laughs> so now that now I have to pay a tax bill in April. Oops, I don't have it. Okay, now I have tax problems, see? So, and I made a lot of money. So I have, I have. if you ask the IRS, they'd say, oh yeah, Mr. Justin, we're still collecting money from him from 2009. You're damn right they are. And I'm still paying on it. Well, why don't you just pay it off? Because it makes more sense to me. Because I have, me and my account have worked it out where I've put the IRS on a payment plan. Okay, that's it. Put them on a payment plan. Why give them all this cash when I can just give them a little bit and keep them off my back? Okay. So my point is, is it's a real easy, slippery slope in, as a business owner to slip into these issues if you're not managing your money right. Okay. Oh. So don't, don't take my former example. Take my current example and take money out and be prepared to write a tax check. All right. And get a good accountant that can do deductions for you and all that for all the business expenses you've had through the year. But make sure you do that, because if you don't, they will follow you around and they probably will anyway. But they will follow you around as a business owner until the day you die.
Okay. The tax mm-hmm. man, when you file for a, a new LLC in your state and then you open up a federal employee identification number, EIN number, that puts you on their radar and they know now you're a small businessman and we're looking at you. Okay. We're watching you. So they'll be watching you for the rest of your life because you don't want to work a job. Might be something funny about this person. Are they laundering money? What are they doing? Are they living in a big house and claiming they don't make no money? Uh Uh-oh. Okay. You, You follow me? I'll tell you this another gold nugget, and maybe this is boring to you, but the federal government is a cake to work with. The IRS is a piece of cake to work with. Do not expect the same treatment from your state government. Your state government will show you no mercy. The IRS will at least work with you a little bit. All right. So whatever you do, don't forget about the state taxes too, all right? Now, I know all this sounds real complicated and maybe even a little discouraging if you're new, but let me tell you something. The money is worth it. Making money is worth paying the tax bill for it. They provide sidewalks for you to walk on. They provide roads for you to drive on. They provide military jets in the sky to keep people from bombing us at night. All right. They provide poor education for public education schools. Okay. But at least it's something. All right. So they do your silent partner does provide you the opportunity to make the money and you have to pay him. That's just the life that we live. All right. So make sure you pay both him and the state because the state will be ruthless. The state will show no mercy. Have you have you read the book like Profit First? I don't think I have, Mateo. Well, that's basically pretty easy. So it basically tell you to say like to divide and whatever money you make as a small business owner, take the fifty percent for you. Have like when you start fifteen percent for your business for your taxes at the end of the year. And the rest invested back on the on the business and take like a little percentage for the business profit. So basically, if you get ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, you get it for yourself. Thirty three hundred dollars, you leave it on the on the for the taxes. A couple a couple hundred dollars, you leave it for your profit, and then the rest is for for taxes. Yeah, that's a good plan. My accountant made it more simple for me and set it like this uh when you make money take a third of it and put it in the bank for for taxes and and stuff like that okay that will work too take another third and reinvest it back into your business structure then take a third and spend it on your living Ooh, ooh. you mean i gotta i gotta live on a third of what I make or a half half is okay too. I found Mateo after deductions and all that. So I like your plan. If you can live on half of what you make, that's the smart way of doing it. And that's a business that will continue to grow. It has money to fund its marketing and to grow in marketing. It has money to do deals and put down earnest money. It has money to do other things. Okay. Okay. It's a business that's primed and ready to grow. It has resources. If you rob the business of everything, then it has nothing and you spend it all. You, you spent it all. You start at zero again. Yep. Okay. And that's been, that's been the story of my life. Okay. Not anymore about, though. Until about five years ago, I got so sick of starting at zero every damn month. Right. And I said, what do I have to do to be different here? And the answer was very simple. Stop spending every damn penny you make. It's that easy. Put yourself on a little system. Unfortunately, they don't teach that in public school. They teach you to spend every fucking thing you make and go back to work tomorrow. That's what it's like. And that's the world they want. That's who they want you to be. Okay, so if that's who you are, that's not necessarily your fault. But if you want better things than that, then you have to break that mold. 
and get into that system of discipline that rarely you will find in your in your peers. Okay. I tell you guys I'm a minimalist. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I've told you how much money I made last year. And I my nut, my monthly nut is about forty five hundred dollars. And that's living well. Is that crazy? I don't think so. Because I got an emergency fund that would burn up a wet mule. Okay. I, I, I can handle it. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. If somebody wrecks the car this afternoon, it's okay. We go get a new one. But how is it that way? Because I stopped spending it all on stuff. You ever had a paycheck come in and you spent it all and then you were thinking about what you bought with it and you couldn't even fucking remember it all? Yeah. Because you bought a bunch of shit you didn't even need. It happens. It's a human thing. Okay, so this is part of being an entrepreneur. I don't care what business you're in, but especially this one, I know, is being sound in your money management, your business acumen. Okay. Somebody somebody used that word in a VIP session recently. I think it was Coach Victor. Business acumen. Okay. I don't know what that means, but it sounds really good. <laughs> All right, guys. Sorry if I lectured you today. I didn't mean to. I just I meant to actually break down another deal, but I'm glad we kind of got into some of the nuts and bolts of this. And I don't mind sharing some bad experiences I've had because that's really how I learned how to do it better. And I don't want you guys to go through the same thing. The worst thing that would be for me is if one of you went out this week and contracted one of these lease option sandwich deals, put a tenant buyer in there, and then six months down the road, you call me up and say, hey, man, what do I do because all oh, that just happened? Oh boy. Okay. It's good to go behind the scenes once in a while. Yeah, I think so too, Jerry. Thank you for saying that. You make me feel better. Yeah. Because everybody questions? everybody tell you about all of the great experiences with real estate. But not many people will go behind and say, yes, I've had this problem. I had this problem. Exactly. And that's where, that's where, as students, you learn from other people's mistakes. I think so, too. I think so, too. It's one thing to be able to, to do the sandwich business, to know how it works, but then it's another thing altogether to make it work properly. And you can't make it work properly if you don't follow those rules we went through, but also to understand what could go wrong here if you don't dot the I's and cross the T's, a lot could go wrong in a sandwich, okay? Um, I think we learned last night, too. You know, sandwich lease options is just a, uh, it's just a strategy on the board, on the deal tree, the strategy tree. It's just another one. Last night, we took the same deal, broke it down with owner finance, subject to, and made like another $200,000 out of it. <laughs> okay, so... You know, again, it's just a tool in the bag. So don't try to make your your 10 millimeter wrench fit every bolt because it won't. I know you guys get that. Uh, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I want to see it successful. So, you know, be choosy about sandwiches. Be choosy. You know, when you go to a sandwich shop, you don't just say, give me what you want me to have. You, you're choosy about it. So the same way here, just be choosy. Any other questions or anything, guys? I love you today. Thank you for being here. We've had a decent group for Tuesday. Hervik and Jerry, Alan, Corey, Mateo, Sandra, Aaron, Jason was here. Any of you, can I help you all in any way whatsoever today? Anything I can maybe help with? Okay. All right. Well, that's it, Justin. We, we appreciate these stories because it, it keeps it, it keeps, you know, it keeps, I feel like I can relate to you more when you, when you, Pulled that back, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I agree with what Jerry was saying. Yeah. Well, I really See, appreciate yeah. you saying that. Yeah, uh, Justin, we appreciate it, man, because that's what like drew me in, even to join this group. You know, a few months ago, man, it was watching some of your videos uh, from afar, and just it was something real that you had in you, you know. So I was like, yeah, man, I got to deal with the people in that group and Justin. So here we are. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. you, bro.
Thank you, sir. And, and Justin, I have been has, uh, in the car industry on several car lots for many years and went through a divorce, okay? And Uncle Sam and I, we're on first name basis. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Being an yeah. entrepreneur, being in business over a period of time, yeah. you run into situations, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna escape the tax guy. That's that's the fact. And uh, what you'll do eventually, you know, uh, Jerry's probably done this. Uh, you'll you'll get an accountant that you trust, and you'll send him a little bit of cash here and there. And uh, when you get a letter, and you will, eventually, everyone will mm -hmm. get a letter from the IRS, and it says you owe this amount of money, and you better pay it by the next this date next month, or we're going to levy this and we're going to take that and we're going to do this. And it might even be, we go to your bank account and rip all the cash out of it and leave you fucking penniless. And that's exactly what they plan to do. But when you get a letter like that, you'll just send it to your accountant and he'll say, okay, let me work on this. I'll, I'll, I'll work on this and get back to you. Okay, good. See, I have an accountant that worked for the IRS for 32 years. Okay. Now, now he's my accountant. So he is a man. He is worth his weight in gold, right? Now, I wish everybody could have an accountant like that, but they're all, a lot of them are good, okay? So they know how to work with the IRS and the state, and they'll tell you the same thing. The state, you're just going to have to pay. You ain't going to work no fucking payment plan out with them. <laughs> they will go to your bank account and take all the money out. Have you ever had that happen, Jerry? No, I never had that to happen. I never had that happen either, but I got close. <laughs> I moved to Florida. I moved to Florida three years ago and I had sold my car dealership. And as I was here, I get a letter from the IRS saying I owe them thousands of dollars, of which I had I wasn't aware of, okay? But like you said before, they're very good about letting you make monthly payments. And I rather than pay them off, I made monthly payments. And, you know, now we're fine. Yeah. I don't mind making the payments if they don't mind leaving me alone. Right. You know, and that's the deal we have right now. I'll make you a payment. You leave me alone. And we'll both be happy. And they want me to review every two years. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it a while. So every two years, I got to go financially undress. I did it earlier this year, financially undress in front of the IRS and say, hey, look up my butt and check my armpits. I don't have that. I'm not storing any money you don't know about. Okay. I don't have nothing you don't know about. You know, that, that's the life of an entrepreneur. So get used to it, especially if you get in hot one once you do get in hot water with the IRS or the state. So it's unpleasant, unpleasant, but it helps to have a, a good accountant. My accountant has told me this, and this is who you need to look for. So mark this, put this away in your in your brain archive, put it in the back of your brain. And when you need an accountant, I want you to remember these words. I'm hypnotizing you right now. You will remember the words that I'm speaking. <laughs> you want an accountant that will say these words to you. I will do your taxes in such a way that you will pay $1 more than what will keep you out of prison. <laughs> I will have you pay them $1 more than prison. Okay. okay, good. That's what I want. Because I know I'm going to have to talk to them anyway. I'm going to have to pay them anyway. I'm going to have to fiddle fart around with them anyway for the rest of my life. So I might as well just pay them the least amount and stay out of prison and keep them off my back. And that's what working in the United States as an entrepreneur, unfortunately, a small businessman, is like. Now, what worries me is when the federal government comes out like they did two weeks ago and announces the Biden administration is is uh, prompting the IRS to investigate the small business owners of America. And we're targeting LLCs and nonprofit organizations. Ooh, boy, I get nervous. Don't target me. Don't target me. I'm already talking to you. I'm already working it out with you. <laughs> Don't target me. I can't make them or not make them. It will be what it will be. 
And at the end of the day, I will pay whatever I have to pay to keep my ass from going to prison. And that's just how life works here. The land of the free and the home of the brave. <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> all right. I love the United States of America, but there's some things that could be better. That's all I'll say. Thank you.